Thanks a lot. Uh, so this was already mentioned, but I thought I'd uh, just point out uh, Prolog. It's not a functional programming language, but it uh, was uh, apparently an influence in Erlang. So it does have some relevance uh, in the uh, Elixir community. And I'll also, uh, I'm location independent for about the past year, so I'm spending some of my time in Montreal. To give you an idea of what I've worked with, uh, this, the top line there, JavaScript, PHP, is where I've probably spent most of the past uh, half decade anyways. Uh, I also have a Java background, uh, and I'm actually going to touch on that a little bit, and enough uh, Ruby and Rails that uh, I can see the familiarity uh, with the Elixir and Phoenix. Uh, now, I chose to use uh, Phoenix for a project that I was working on, and uh, that was a conference registration application uh, for a series of small conferences. And uh, it was a CMS-based thing and wasn't the best fit. So why did I choose to put it onto Elixir? Uh, I was using Drupal. Uh, which is great if you want to use Drupal, but it wasn't, wasn't a great fit. Uh, PHP, I'm not in love with PHP, and I was really looking to use something else. And I saw something on Elixir uh, about a year and a half ago, and decided that would be a great way to go. And the more I heard about it, the more I studied Phoenix, it sounded like the way to go. So I decided to use Phoenix 1.3 as actually, I think, release candidate one. So it wasn't even out in the wild officially at that time. Uh, but uh, I liked what I saw there, even though it was probably a bad idea to go with a, a release candidate. I figured, well, I've got enough time. I can always, I can always revert and go back and uh, fix it up later. Uh, now, of the features of 1.3, the one that was most interesting to me was context. And uh, I've just got a link, I'm going to uh, post a link to GitHub repo with all this stuff. Uh, if you do want to, if you haven't seen this video, it's Chris McCord's talking about uh, the new features in 1.3. So he goes over some of the other stuff. Definitely a good watch if you haven't seen it already. So what are contexts? They come from the, the concept of uh, bounded context from domain-driven design. And uh, this actually uh, is, was mentioned in Chris McCord's talk, I think, or at least online he's mentioned it. Uh, it's basically breaking up your domain into different, uh, different contexts. And how you apply that, I guess, it, it could vary a lot. I'll go with, into how it's, how it's done in, uh, in Phoenix. So that link's there if you want to take a look. Uh, now, Phoenix 1.2 is very straightforward. You had the controller directly accessing model, or they called it a model, uh, even though it's not an object-oriented design. Uh, they got rid of the model terminology for 1.3 and basically just put an extra layer in between that corresponds with this concept of bounded context. So instead of uh, what we were doing before, where we go direct to the model, just go through that extra layer. And uh, that provides a little bit of a separation of concerns, which is a good thing. And I'll show you what that means. Um, first of all, I just actually included in the repo a little demo app, uh, which I didn't even really do much with. I just wanted to, to, to show you what gets generated if you uh, uh, generate a context. Uh, in 1.2, this little line or this little thing there would not be there. So what I'm doing is I'm generating scaffolding, typical uh, sample application of a blog. So I have uh, uh, a schema called post, a table called posts. There's a title, a body, etc. But this is the new thing. And it's probably not a great idea to call your context context, but that's what I use just so it's clear in this example. 
You know, if you're the kind of person who calls your dog a dog, <laughs> be my guest. Uh, so it, this is the key thing that gets generated, this context. Can you see that okay? Is everyone? Hopefully it's big enough. Uh, uh, and this is, this is what you're calling, not the post schema struct or module that, uh, that was generated. And uh, it also generates some, some nice tests, so better than the tests that were in uh, 1.2. So in the code, this is uh, just a little snippet of controller code. In 1.2, you would have had something like this. This is the index method, uh, or I guess it's a function, not a method, uh, that would uh, pull up a list of posts if you hit the main page of, of your sample blog. And it calls, sorry if that's a little small, basically your controller calls repo.all, which is part of Acto. And even if you're not familiar with Acto, it's basically just the, 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 the database layer that Phoenix uses. So that's the important thing. The controller is directly calling repo all. That changed to call the context. So now you have a nicely named, I think, Dog, yeah. Uh, Context.list posts. And that returns a list of posts, and then that gets injected into a uh, template and rendered as HTML. So, not very much different in most cases. This is the most basic example of uh, uh, controller code. If you were maybe doing an update, it's a little bit more involved, but still, it strips it down to like a single function call in most cases. So that's the separation of concerns. The controller knows nothing about Ecto. It doesn't need to know that you have a database. It's just calling something, give me a list of whatever, of posts. And if in the future we are changing, if we're getting rid of Ecto or we're using some totally different type of storage, uh, the controller doesn't have to change. Now, uh, it was mentioned this was a little bit uh, controversial. If anyone is reading um, uh, Elixir Forum website, uh, this was a post that went on for hundreds of posts and uh, uh, eventually got locked, uh, but turned into not quite a flame war, but a bit of a heated conversation. Uh, context, a barrier too high for newbies. Basically, the reasoning of the original post here was that, well, in Rails, it might not be the ideal architecture for a lot of things, uh, but you know, if you're having trouble, just hire more people from a boot camp, and uh, they'll they'll get your application done. So, I would paraphrase, paraphrase it as Rails is a hot mess, but it's a successful hot mess. It doesn't have to be a hot mess. And I mentioned Java. I want to, uh, just in case there's any old folks around here, uh, draw a little parallel to uh, one of the patterns that uh, I used to see in the Java world, uh, the facade pattern. So I think of this as the analog to the, uh, the context, the uh, facade, if you can see my pointer there and this to the, the model or the schema. This is, these are objects that represent what's probably in your database or some sort of persistent data store. And it will uh, be what I think of as nouns. I have a post, I have comments, I have a user. So that's the noun. The left part is the verb. List posts, update post, delete user. And in the, this pattern, your controller or client, if it was a thick client, uh, would be calling the verb. It would be calling the facade. And that would be the way it would separate things out. You're only talking uh, to that layer, not directly manipulating uh, the different data objects. 
So where we, would we take this next? If you go through and generate stuff, you'll, uh, you'll get a, uh, a bunch of context functions. But you can, you can make your own. So in the example of uh, my hypothetical blog, uh, I create something that, uh, a function that is a get users and post, and it might return, well, might return something like this. I'm almost at the end. Damn it. So uh, it would have the user object and then embedded within that a list of posts. The other thing for what's next, uh, in that long thread I mentioned, uh, Chris McCord, the, the creator of, of Phoenix, he mentioned that uh, earlier on they were thinking about including transaction logic into the context layer. And maybe because of my weird Java history, I think that would be super cool. I would love that. Uh, so maybe, maybe somewhere down the line, or maybe I'm going to incorporate that more in my app. I'm, uh, does everyone know uh, what a transaction is? Actually, before I mention that, I'll, I'll quickly run through it, uh, just in case someone's maybe not so much into the database world. Uh, think of an example of, uh, the simplest example is of uh, transferring some money from your checking account to your savings account. Think of the steps in that. Uh, subtract $100 from uh, your checking account. Add $100 to your savings account. Step three, write something into a ledger or something. Done. But what happens if you go to step one, subtract $100 from your checking account? Power goes out. You're stuck, you lost $100 or a million dollars or whatever. Uh, so a transaction ensures that you will go all the way to the end, and if something bad happens in the middle, it rolls back to the state bit before it was. Uh, so a lot of, if it's your blog, it doesn't matter. If it's your banking application, yeah, you're probably, you're probably gonna care a lot. So hopefully I'll be able to put something like that in or it will actually make it into Phoenix because that would be cool. Um, just want to mention a little bit about my experience. Uh, this is my first real project that I've done in Elixir, and uh, in terms of efficiency of development, I found it slow because I was looking up everything, researching, I want to make sure I did it the right the first time, so it was 90% learning and 10% coding, so I'd study for a day and write six, six lines of code but they would be really nice six lines of code. And in terms of getting up to speed, I would say, uh, depending on your experience in doing uh, web applications, do one slightly ambitious project or maybe a couple of little hobby projects. I think you could probably get fairly productive uh, because once it's up and running, it's, I, I just found it a great environment to, to work with. It, it's like stepping into a fine European luxury sedan. Everything's where you expect it. And write tests. Uh, it, it, uh, 1.3 does generate good tests for you, but um, uh, write more. Uh, I went through a funny thing where I actually rolled back to 1.2. Amazingly easy to do. Uh, but 1.3 wouldn't work with some of the authentication stuff I was trying to use. And uh, because of my tests, I was just renaming a few modules to get it to run. Uh, took very little time, I was surprised. Uh, downside, the generated code, say you have half a dozen or a dozen uh, different schema representing database tables you would get all the access functions, all the, uh, the context functions crammed into one file. And uh, that's not so bad. What I actually did was just split it up. So this is hard to see. But I just, uh, I just created a folder with all this stuff and then I, I include it into the, uh, uh, the context file. So instead of this being a giant file, I just add a bunch of stuff. I don't even know if this is the best way to do it, but 
uh, it kept things organized for me. That's it.